I saw that they had a hippies collection, a pretty vast hippies collection. And I was like, mm, you know, you really need to have the punk collection too, not just hippies, because San Francisco had a pretty big punk scene. So that was Avengers vocalist Penelope Houston. I'm Jeff, and this is Storied San Francisco. Every week on this podcast, you'll hear from musicians, photographers, writers, and San Franciscans from all walks of life, telling stories, sharing personal histories, and trying to put into words what makes this city so special. Welcome to episode 36, part two. In part one, Penelope talked about coming to San Francisco in 1976 as a student at the Art Institute. She and her friends found a home in the early punk scene at the time, and she became the front person of the band The Avengers. In this podcast, Penelope takes us to the show her band played with the Sex Pistols at Winterland in 1978. After that, she walks through her musical career, including her solo act and another incarnation of The Avengers later on. She ends the episode describing her work at the SF Public Library, where she's putting together a punk rock archive. Here's Penelope. So then some, somehow we got invited to come back and play some real shows. Yeah. Uh, real. Where you're all playing the same song at the same time. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we morphed from being an opening band to being a headlining band in about three or four months. Oh, wow. Yeah. So y'all, y'all were good. Yeah. And we kept writing songs and, you know, working on that and... Um, we were pretty serious about the band. And I, so that would have been at the end of the school year. May, uh, our first shows were in June. And then by July, we were kind of like immersed in the Avengers. That was wow. That's our life. Yeah. Did you already know, like, did, did you go back to school? And did you know I th- one way or the other? I think I might have gone back one more semester and then decided this is a total waste of time. Yeah, because now you have this other thing. Yeah, like I have other things to do. So, um, do you want to talk at all about? Well, do you want to talk about the Sex Pistols show, and then do you want to talk about anything between where we are and and that kind of leading up to that? Or before but, that happened, we went to LA and we were invited by these friends of ours who had this little tiny record label that was putting out singles. And they were called Danger House, mm-hmm. and um, they were also friends with with. Tomato and Tommy from the Screamers. Some of them shared. I think KK Barrett was in this in the Screamers, and he was also one of the people who started this label. And we um, we went down there to record in October. So between June and October, we were already recording a record. This is of seventy seven. Crazy, yeah. And we did. We decided to do three songs, and it was. Um, we are the one I believe in me and car crash. And when we went in to record, I believe in me, I didn't have any written down lyrics. We just had the chorus. So we played the song and they recorded the band and everything. And then they said, now, uh, do you want to go in and do your, your vocals? And I said, no, that was it. What I just did is the record. I don't, I don't want to do it again. I just, it was like, I was kind of nervous. It was our first time ever in the studio. And it was just like, what was wrong with that? <laughs> so when you listen to that, you hear off the top of my head, you know, rambling and yelling and yelping. So after that, I always just make up the lyrics to that song. It's always, um, it's always a timely lyric. I just think about what I'm thinking about at that time and go off on a kind of a little rant and that was really fun and that came out really fast right after we recorded it it was amazing still (laughs) in 77 or yeah in 77 so it came out later in the same month i think Mm -hmm. in october and it went all over the world and we didn't really know that at the time Mm -hmm. but people in europe or people in england were like oh wow listen to this so somehow between October and January, um, when the Pistols came out, the Malcolm McLaren had a friend in L.A., Rory Johnston, and he was going to be the tour manager for the Pistols, but he also was like somehow 
having a West Coast Glitter House connection um, and trying to find connections for them. And he wanted to manage us. So he got us on the bill with uh, the Pistols at Winterland. Mm -hmm. And that was the biggest show they ever played, certainly the biggest we'd ever played. By that time, we were playing to four or 500 people at the, at the MAB, like basically selling out the MAB. And um, the nuns who had been around before us and had had success before us also got added to that bill, probably because of who they knew in town and uh bill graham i think he was kind of like punk rock he thought it was really disgusting yeah he didn't like it at all and the nuns were the opening act and we were the support act and i remember um one of the nuns called me up and said yo penelope you know if you want to switch with us that's 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 okay with us we're willing to do that and i was like (laughs) thank you very much jeff but i think not yeah I think we'll just stick with what we got here and you know we'll see what happens <laughs> yeah so the night came it was pretty much sold out it was like almost five, between five and six thousand people there um how, how would do you how did you at that time regard the sex pistols were they oh well we thought they were great you know they had the record out they seemed kind of jaded already mm. somehow and then they were on this big tour but their big tour didn't have any big cities in it until <laughs> they got to the winterland <laughs> they were playing like weird you know atlanta and dallas or i don't know i believe the they South. played in dallas yeah they skipped la everyone in la was totally pissed everyone in seattle um they didn't play new york <laughs> it was like what are they doing so the final show was their biggest show of that tour and their biggest show ever for them mm-hmm. And um, all the punks came from L.A. and all the punks came from Seattle. Everyone on the West Coast came to you the said show. Four or five thousand. Five or six thousand. Five or six. Yeah. Yeah. It was I never massive. never had the chance to go to Winterland, so I wasn't sure how big it was. Yeah. But, oh my it God. was five or six between like five fifty. Five. Like I mean, fifty five hundred. Fifty five hundred. It's like a little yeah. arena. That's yeah. I mean, um, so. The weird thing was all those people, we were used to playing to people we knew and recognized generally. And there was way more than that there. So there was a lot of people we didn't know who they were. And the nuns got up and played and they got spat on so much. I think that there was a huge contingent of people that were just curious about what this punk rock thing was. Mm -hmm. And they heard that you throw things and you spit and you behave very badly. (laughs) And so that was going on during the nun set. And when I went out to the mic during our set, I slipped on the stage. I was covered in spit. And... um, I was so nervous. I was just like, I didn't fall, slip and fall into a bunch of spit, but it was just like, ah. And then at some point during the nun set, they had this beautiful singer. Uh, they had two guy singers who were not definitely not beautiful, kind of like um, guys from the Bronx or whatever. They're New York guys and uh, with leather jackets and like, ah. And then they had this beautiful blonde singer who was from Marin, I think. Jennifer Miro, and she would play the keyboards and sort of not move very um, like Marlene Dietrich. Mm-hmm. And somebody said that she got spat on during, <laughs> during the set, <laughs> and she just kept playing. And she didn't she didn't move, and I just like picture this loogie going down her face slowly. It's this image in my mind. I don't know if it's actually if it actually happened or not, but it's a great story. So anyway, when we got up there, we were really rather nervous and um it, more about the crowd than the set or what? no that was the biggest pe- size, crowd we'd ever yeah. played to and we saw people we knew but then they disappear and everyone was getting squeezed out of the crowd it was so jam-packed in the front you couldn't really like lock eyes with one of your friends mm-hmm. because they'd disappear in the crowd in a mm-hmm. second so we just did it and and i feel like if you watch the set which is up online you can see us going from really nervous to like sort of triumphant in the end. And um, then we got off stage and the Pistols eventually got on stage and they, uh, people started throwing things. They were, you know, yelling um, 
they were yelling they were taunting taunting yes exactly i think johnny rodden said you know is this all you got like they were swing cameras and he was like this is better <laughs> it was crazy uh did you get to hang out with them backstage at no all? they didn't hang out with us there was a huge crowd of uh journalists hanging out backstage and somebody there was beer and there was popcorn and there was a bunch of punks that had gotten back there and friends of ours and and the uh, all the opening bands um, us and the nuns plus there was another band that was supposed to play after the pistols called negative trend mm. and then they didn't let him play of course was, i think that i think that uh Malcolm said, well, who's the worst band in town? And someone said, Negative Trend. And they said, well, we want them to play after the Pistols. <laughs> and Bill Graham just wouldn't have it. Also, they had Richard Meltzer in between bands, who was the MC, And he was like trying to stir up the crowd and using all kinds of profanity. And I saw Bill Graham like strong arming him off the stage. It was terrifying. Like for me, I was like 19 year old punk. I was just like, what's going on? I guess I was 20 at that point. Anyway, it, afterwards it was a real scene in the backstage area. People were sliding around on popcorn and beer flying through the air and all the photographers were like flashing their bulbs and and um, we were just kind of getting out of control. And But the pistols did not show up. Then there was an after party and the pistols did show up to the after party and I think I met Paul Cook and Steve Jones and... Um, and Sid Vicious OD'd at the after party and went to the Haight-Ashbury free clinic, which is pretty funny. It's like a San Francisco landmark. Um, and recover he recovered and they went on their way. So one thing that came out of us playing with pis pistols was that Steve Jones decided in his post-pistol career he was going to be a producer of records and he wanted to produce our, our record so we recorded four songs with him in 78 later in 78 and went um we those they were kind of going to be used to try to get the band a deal and then that didn't happen and he went off doing some other crazy thing in South America <laughs> and and we re-recorded some of the vocals on there. And then we got, so we were about to put out a record um, and our, our guitar player quit, Greg quit the band. And then we got another guitar player and it was sort of different sound. The sound was slightly different. And then after a few months of that, um, we recorded with him actually a couple songs. And then we uh, broke up in the summer of 79. And the record came out within six months and that was a 12 inch um four song ep on on white noise records which is a kind of little known label and then after that um danny and jimmy put together the pink album which is what we're sort of known for uh which is a combination of the danger house the white noise a bunch of other things that we recorded on spec in different places and um and this is after you all broke was, up or we bro after we broke up that came out in 80 like 82 ish and then it had a life of its own it just sort of took off and by that time i'd moved to england um, i'd lived in la for a little while working with a crazy dutch filmmaker and the screamers and we made a film and, and then i moved to england uh, fell in love got married and came back to the U.S. Um, on a visit that was supposed to be like buy a Dodge Dart, drive across the country, record everything, and with film. And I was going to say film, right? Film video. and and video or film actually, and uh, and write songs and like have this sort of creative artistic thing across the country, sell the car, go back to England. But that we never, sounds good to me today. <laughs> we never went back. Yeah. <laughs> The car broke down. We bought it in Seattle. We drove down the coast, and we got as far as L.A., and it broke down. And then we ended up back in San Francisco somehow. And I ran into Greg, the original guitar player from The Avengers, and he had all these really weird songs with no, uh, just instrumental. And I was like, I could use some of these. So I decided I would, you know, 
do this project. And that was in the mid 80s, early 80s. Um, and I started to do songwriting on my own and with Greg and with other people and started out this whole so-called solo career and had a bunch of bands and stayed here. And I got a job at the library in 86, maybe, as a page. The, this, other, building. the other building, right, yeah. where the Asian Art Museum is. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually uh, that solo career blossomed into uh, some success and had a few albums out. And then I got signed to Warner's in Germany and I started touring over there all the time. And as Penelope Houston? As or? Penelope Houston. Got it. And her band or the first record was called Bird Boys, but I think that was Penelope Houston and the Bird Boys. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. So then I had a bunch of solo albums out and I, was on this major label and um, I had stopped working at the library for a good seven years and uh, had a kind of other career, which was awesome. And at the same time, the Avengers were never forgotten. People always wanted to hear that stuff, that material and were bugging me about it. And the um, evil company that had put out the Pink album had just stopped paying the band, you know, eight years mm -hmm. earlier and we were getting into lawsuits with them and it was a real big mess besides greg were you still talking with the other with danny and yeah somewhat okay, danny had moved to sweden so he wasn't that reachable and jimmy had gone on to be in chris isaac's band okay he created that that sound that guitar sound the twang yeah. and um jimmy also kind of disappeared from sight of his own volition basically yeah. um and so uh, Lookout Records wanted the Avengers to release something, but we couldn't get the Pink Album. So we put together all this other recorded material and live material that we found. And then there were three songs that we'd never recorded uh, that were good songs. So we went in the studio with Greg and um, Joel Reeder, who had was introduced to me by Billy Joe from Green Day, who I'd done some recording with, with Joel. And then Danny Panic, the drummer from Screeching Weasel. So the four of us went and recorded these three songs, and then Look Out put out the record, and they said, oh, yeah, you have to play the record release party. And I was like, <laughs> okay. Wow, we have you. <laughs> yeah. And so then once I had done... And this would be late, 80, late 80s what? now? No, late. we're in the 90s. Oh, in the 90s. Okay. Early 90s, yeah. All right. So... Then it was kind of like I tasted, it was, it was just like singing loud again. It was just like singing to the microphone again. It was like, ah, I'm going to be the singer of the Avengers again. Was the like music. Screaming, like there was something so cathartic about going back to those songs and screaming totally. at the top of my lungs. And I really liked the music too. The stuff so you were doing as a solo artist was, was a departure or? Yes. Yeah. It was quite different. Okay. Um, it was kind of like little Americana, um, a little countryish, a little jazz. Yeah. I mean, singer-songwriter had really blossomed at that point and mm -hmm. was become quite popular. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's why I got signed mm -hmm. to a major label. Mm -hmm. And um, so at the same time, Lookout was putting this out, and it was, it was kind of like this bizarre dual uh, musical front. And... Um, and then I started working at the library again and uh, decided to um, go back to school. I went and got my, ma my bachelor's at uh, SF State in, uh, in printmaking and painting. I went back to painting. Many years passed. <laughs> and eventually um, I was working in the library. I got hired up, up here in the uh, in the in special collections. I'd been, uh, for about eight years, I was working basically triage, which is the information desk on the first floor. Oh, I know it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Know it's like every person comes in with their question. Like 50% of it is where's the bathroom. The bathroom. 
then another 20% where are the computers and then some people are like where's my mind you know okay. like people are talking inside my head can I get them out like mm -hmm. there are bugs in my clothes and stuff I was like you mean real bugs or are we talking to <laughs> psychological bugs yeah. or are we talking about listening devices I was gonna say yeah all three of those would, of could those. come up and, on any day and ask me that question. Who hired you uh, up here? Um, it was uh, Susan Goldstein, the city archivist. It was one of the people that hired me, and uh, Lisa Dunseth was the head of uh, Book Arts at the time mm -hmm. I got hired. So I've been here for about five years in, in this department, and I work with both departments because we only have one, we share one desk, so every person coming up here either for book arts or history sf history is going to come to the same desk and talk to people so we have to learn everything of both departments and i saw that they had a hippies collection a pretty vast hippies collection and i was like mm, you know you really need to have the punk collection too not just hippies because san francisco had a pretty big punk scene so did you have to do like a formal pitch no to get that it no. was basically what you just said. Yeah, I was just like, <laughs> look at look at Stanford, look at Bancroft, look at you know, all these different institutions across the country are starting to collect punk. Mm -hmm. um, UCLA and Los Angeles Public, Los Angeles Public, mm -hmm. uh, Washington D.C. Public Library, they all have punk collections. I was just like, you know, I'm here. I can help facilitate this, and you can have the Avengers Penelope Houston collection and it's going to be gigantic because I have wow. a lot of stuff saved a lot of stuff so um, we talked about it and then I started talking to people in the community and seeing who's interested in bringing stuff and then you have gigantic collections like Vail, v -Vail from Search and Destroy sold a huge collection to UCLA for a huge amount of money and we don't have money you know right. we're just living on the generosity of donors mm -hmm. but we've gotten some some really cool stuff and we're getting more cool stuff all the time every time we get um i did a podcast with uh sf chronicle and suddenly people were like contacting me like oh I bring some stuff in <laughs> so uh it's been super exciting People sending me photos and flyers and stuff. Elaine Vestal sent a huge collection of photos that were her own photos and then flyers. Um, New Youth Productions brought me their collection of like, including, New Youth Productions was this group of like basically teenagers <laughs> back in 78 um, who decided to incorporate and become a nonprofit and raise money to start their own club that they could go to because I think the MAB was 18 and over. And um, they wanted to create this whole space that would support the audience and the artists. And kind of like Gilman, but way before. Free Gilman, yeah, it was exactly. Um, I wonder what's happening with Gilman's collection. But they're still they're still using it yeah. probably so I kind of was trying to limit this collection to 75 to 85 okay. um, the early stuff but when people come in like I had uh, Alfie from the chatterbox who ran the chatterbox in the 90s she has every single flyer they ever had all their you know booking information like just a ton of stuff she brought it to me and I was like, thank you. We'll definitely take this. Mm -hmm. So we're not really limited to that time period. But that's my focus. That's uh, what I know the most about. Anybody, any member of the public or a researcher, whoever, can come up to the sixth floor of the main library and ask to see things from the punk collection. The punk collection has not been processed yet. So it's a little harder to get to see what we have. But I did create a kind of a finding aid. Um, I'm not an archivist, although I play one on podcasts. Uh, <laughs> but I created a finding aid, and uh, people can look through that and see what they want to look at. We have um, in our reading rooms in the San Francisco History Center, it's a secure room. People have to hand over their backpacks and bags. And then when they're looking at material, they have to give their ID to, that we hold while they're looking at the material. So 
things don't walk away. Um, and if you want to look at actual photographs, you have to come in on the days the photo desk is open, which is Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So it's always good to call ahead to the history department and, and uh, talk to the people about what you want to see, when, you, when is a good time to see it. The Avengers are still playing. We are actually are going to go on a tour with Stiff Little Fingers across the U.S. Huge tour. It's not like, in a Dodge Dart, please. Not in a Dodge Dart, but like in a Dodge van. I don't know. <laughs> we'll be in a van. Um, and that's going to be 28 shows or something insane like that. It's about seven, six. No, it's about five weeks. And it'll be this October. We'll definitely play every city where people are hearing this. That was Penelope Houston. Check back next week when we'll have Patrick O'Malley, another local musician, on the show. Music for the podcast is by Otis McDonald. Film photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. All 85 episodes are up on our website, storiedsf.com. You can also help support this project there by going to our store page and checking out the different pledge levels. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date on all the stuff we do. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please rate and review the show. And if you have any comments, suggestions of who should be on the show, or you just want to share whatever's on your mind, our email is storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.